In this lecture, we are going to discuss the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. Uh, at the uh, beginning, in, in just a moment, I'm going to take you to the uh, WebCT site and show you the uh, textbook, basically, the source of the information to generate uh, this lecture. Uh, I basically have put it together from an internet uh, PubNet, PubMed <coughs> uh, search through the literature. It's a few years old, but that's fine. It still updates us uh, way beyond our initial introductory textbook. Um, as I continue to teach this course and develop it, uh, I hope to add more and more updated research articles as separate presentations. Uh, <clears throat> as you will uh, note, um, probably in future years, not necessarily this year that we're doing it here, uh, but <clears throat> more than enough information already, I'm sure. So uh, under the course uh, materials, the course content, uh, there is uh, a link here at present, uh, the HPA, HPG axis interaction, we used that earlier, so that's not uh, part of what we're doing now. Uh, and then there's this one, the HPA axis links, uh, that also is not uh, part, I know it's kind of weird to be pointing out what is not, but anyway, <laughs> at this stage, uh, it's important to know those as well. Um, they are interesting uh, links, and you might check them out, but this number 11, the HPA axis uh, references for lecture notes, uh, is the one to check, and basically it's just a file that contains the abstracts, uh, you know, titles, journals, authors, obviously, you know, the full reference uh, to each of the articles, and as well, uh, the full abstract is there uh, for you. And here, you should be able to right-click on these and then select print <clears throat> in order to uh, print those out, uh, if that's what you would like to do. I haven't tried that yet, so I don't know really what it looks like. Uh, the way this is set up, uh, Apparently doesn't give you the option to download it. <clears throat> Another uh, approach, if that doesn't uh, work so well, let's see if we can do a right click and get a select all here. Doesn't quite do that, but you can just click at the beginning and then select the whole thing. And then when you do the right click, to print, <clears throat> you can tell it just to print the selection. There's a choice there to print uh, the selection, <clears throat> and that'll just pull that text that you've highlighted. It won't do all the other aspects of it. If you're familiar with printing web pages, uh, it would just print out that text <clears throat> that you have selected, so that's one alternative. Otherwise, uh, of course, uh, the endo text uh, is a, a good source. And the Endotext 2 link that we have in there is the actual, you know, the original uh, site. Uh, but I think most of the uh, information about the, the CRH <coughs> is actually here with the pituitary disease and neuroendocrinology uh, that we had talked about. Uh, <coughs> so I'll let you uh, look there uh, to find the information on the HPA uh, axis moment I don't remember exactly where it is on there uh, so uh, I won't take your time doing that <clears throat> you can take a quick look so let's switch over to our PowerPoint presentation I'll set my arrow and uh, we will discuss the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis we've already talked uh, extensively about the uh, ACTH uh, hormone 2 from the thyrotropes uh, and uh, quite extensively about the uh, gland 3 hormones 3 uh, in, in the steroidogenesis lecture. So this lecture really is just going to uh, focus on the hypothalamus, the CRH and its gene, and its re regulation of that gene expression. Uh, <clears throat> and I think a little bit on the, GNR, the C CRH receptor uh, on the pituitary... Uh, corticotropes. So the corticotropes as far as ACTH and ACTH uh, regulation uh, and the adrenal cortex 
uh, for the story of Genesis, as we said, uh, is part of prior lectures. So <clears throat> let's just focus uh, on uh, the hormone one for a moment. Uh, we recall that uh, the corticotropin releasing hormone, or CRH, when it was first discovered, it wasn't really, actually it was one of the first, I think actually, let me clarify, it was the first hypothalamic releasing hormone that was identified and nearly the, the last one uh, to be isolated and characterized uh, completely. There, it's a very interesting story. For a while, hemoglobin was being chased down as a hypothalamic extract that could affect the pituitary. So there are many different secretagogues for ACTH uh, is what it came down to, and that created a real challenge because only the uh, isolation, you know, the aqueous phase or the lipid phase uh, methods were available uh, with a little bit of column chromatography and a few things like that when they first started chasing down these hypothalamic hormones. Uh, and then you had to, to uh, <clears throat> try to uh, assess the biological activity through bioassays to see if you had a, a component there. And then you start uh, using various methods to get fractions. And uh, of course, just about the time uh, that the work had been completed from that approach, chasing the, the peptide uh, or polypeptide itself from the hypothalamic extracts, recombinant uh, DNA or molecular biology techniques uh, came to the forefront and were more uh, universally applicable to various areas beyond uh, microbes and specialty uh, areas. So they became more uh, universally utilized in uh, research labs of all types. So uh, in 1981, just after Wiley Vale and co-workers isolated the uh, corticotropin-releasing hormone, CRF factor it was called at that time, from 490,000 ovine hypothalami uh, to be a 41 uh, amino acid residue uh, polypeptide with the molecular weight of 4,670, recombinant DNA technology emerged uh, and very quickly uh, with uh, money, a much smaller amount of uh, tissue. Uh, <clears throat> this is a lot of trips to the, uh, the slaughterhouse to, to get, collect that many uh, hypothalami uh, from sheep and, uh, you know, rapidly enough so that you can freeze them and preserve all of the peptides. So recombinant DNA technology uh, was welcomed by everyone, and through that approach uh, they were able to deduce the rat-human CRH uh, sequence and uh, to find many uh, homologous uh, peptides in uh, other organisms or even in humans. So there were homologies with the Sava gene uh, found in the frog skin. Uh, responsible for um, a lot of the uh, skin coloration in frogs, and urotensin found in the, the fish neurosecretory uh, organ, uh, basically related to the stress response of the fish, and of course changes in skin coloration or skin color in general are related to survival um, tolerating uh, stressful disturbances in the environment, so there was a, a consistency there. Uh, and then angiotensin uh, as well <coughs> uh, has some homologies with the CRH. Turns out uh, angiotensin, of course, does target the uh, zona reticularis of the adrenal cortex <coughs> and um, uh, is also an ACTH secretagogue. <clears throat> so there's some coordination between the renin angiotensin system and the HPA axis uh, to accomplish some of their common goals uh, mediated through the adrenal cortex. Uh, the pre-prohormone pre -pro uh, for CRH is 190 amino acid residues, so obviously much larger than uh, the biologically active molecule, 41 amino acids. Uh, in addition, it's important to note that, uh, recall uh, in our discussion of uh, ACTH, we stated that it was a linear mo molecule it, uh, because it had many proline residues in it. Uh, CRH is uh, different from that. 
uh, it has amino acid residues within, within it so that it forms an alpha helix as part of its post-translational uh, processing. Uh, so it is, uh, you, you sometimes will see the term alpha helical CRH uh, as the biologically active uh, form of, of the CRH. <clears throat> So the pre-pro hormone has uh, uh, many additional amino acid residues, uh, as you uh, might sp suspect for the pre-pro hormones. Uh, the CRH41 is the uh, C-terminal portion. Uh, from these original amino acid residues of the pre-pro hormone, it corresponds to 148 through 188. And uh, as we'll see, it's preceded by an arch arch. So these are these uh, uh, <clears throat> basic amino acid residues uh, that are prime targets for carboxyendopeptidases. Uh, the C-terminal uh, glycine residue is converted to an amide. We recall that uh, we saw that with TRH uh, as well. So it's a common mechanism for uh, post-translational processing of the biologically uh, active molecules to extend their half-life uh, in the plasma. CRH uh, gene is the next thing we want to discuss, but before going to that, I do want to mention that uh, originally in our general introductory discussions about where these hypothalamic peptides could be found, uh, in other words, in the hypothalamic pituitary uh, portal uh, vascular uh, plasma or serum <clears throat> uh, at any level uh, to, that could easily be detected. In other words, uh, they reached concentrations that were physiologically relevant in that small volume vasculature, but once it was washed past the uh, anterior pituitary and di di diluted in the, the full blood volume of the body, uh, quite typically, the hypothalamic releasing and inhibiting hormone levels uh, are below levels of detection. <clears throat> but CRH became an exception to that, uh, and it, it turned out that uh, uh, it could be detected in the plasma of pregnant women, and uh, it has uh, an origin from the placenta. <clears throat> so there's a very important role uh, in the HPA, for the HPA and development, uh, embryonic and fetal development, and thus uh, there is an extra hypothalamic and extra pituitary uh, system that uh, is, uh, becomes operational, if you will, or functional uh, in pregnancy. <clears throat> so it's, this is one example where there are, are two uh, sources of the hypothalamic, of the releasing hormone, uh, and uh, therefore, uh, uh, the concentrations reach detectable levels uh, in the plasma under certain conditions, that is, of course, pregnancy. So the sequence and the tissue-specific expression have been uh, investigated. Uh, there are two exons. Exon 1 encodes the five prime untranslated region of the mRNA. So this is becoming quite common. We see exon 1 in most cases. Uh, includes this five prime untranslated region of the message. Exon 2, therefore, encodes the entire RAT CRH uh, precursor. <clears throat> uh, the nucleotide uh, sequence homology between the human and the RAT genes reveals several highly conserved regions, including the CRH peptide encoding sequence and the five prime uh, uh, flanking sequence. When, when, whenever we see this terminology, we know that it's referring now to the five prime uh, uh, <clears throat> portion that is upstream of the start site, therefore uh, promoter region. So this is just another way of indicating the promoter region, the five prime flanking uh, sequence. <clears throat> so there's a tremendous homology between rat and human. Uh, CRH, so therefore uh, pretty much any antibody that's generated against uh, rat or human CRH has a high degree of cross-reactivity uh, with the CRH from the other species. In performing RNA blot analyses, uh, it, was able, it was possible to demonstrate that CRH uh, mRNA <coughs> uh, can be observed in numerous regions of the rat brain 
as well as the spinal cord, the adrenal gland itself, the pituitary, and the testes. So there are uh, multiple other uh, sources, even outside the nervous system, but definitely extra, th extra hypothalamic sources of CRH mRNA. And in each of these sites, uh, it's been demonstrated that the uh, gene is expressed endogenously. That's what this RNA blot analysis uh, was showing, and that this message is translated into uh, the fully uh, biologically active uh, CRH. <clears throat> so there are many, uh, it's M-I-N-Y, many, no, M-I-N-I, not <laughs> Uh, so there are many HPA axes, if you will, kind of distributed throughout the body. Uh, so this began to uh, emerge. And one of the first approaches in searching out peptides and their distributions uh, is, and it's common for uh, these approaches in studying these molecules, whether they're studying the gonads uh, or the brain or the heart, <clears throat> as you take your organ of interest, and then you snag uh, some organs uh, uh, from other locations uh, in the organisms. And then you look for the, the expression of the gene, presence of RNA, of course, uh, the, the uh, expression of the peptide or protein <coughs> um, in uh, you know, you, using other methods of looking at that, like a Western blot <coughs> type of an analysis or a rate amino assay. Uh, and it's just a common approach to see uh, if the organ of interest or focus of your research uh, produces the highest levels. Uh, and then, of course, in the brain, you look at uh, different locations, and especially for the hypothalamic uh, hormones thought to be uh, dedicated to anterior and posterior pituitary uh, release or function or regulation, excuse me, <coughs> uh, you looked at extra hypothalamic sources. So is it specific to the hypothalamus? Then it might be uh, specific for the regulation of the pituitary gland or release at the posterior pituitary. <coughs> um, and of course, we now know that there's extra hypothalamic expression of these genes. Uh, many of the uh, hypothalamic releasing and inhibiting hormones uh, are synthesized in many extra hypothalamic areas. So that's why uh, it just turned out that uh, the adrenal gland and the uh, pituitary in the testes uh, were investigated in this case. And then ultimately, as I said, uh, the placenta was uh, evaluated uh, uh, once the CRH was found to be at high levels uh, in the plasma of pregnant females. I should say pregnant women. Uh, obviously, when you say pregnant it's going to be a female. <clears throat> so uh, the CRH gene, continuing then, the human uh, CRH gene is located on the long arm of chromosome 8. Uh, so you're beginning to see this level of detail for memorization emerging uh, on this type of material. Uh, so uh, <clears throat> you will find test questions that will ask you these specific types uh, of uh, information uh, <clears throat> either for you to uh, type in in a short answer or to select from a multiple choice or maybe even a matching. So it's localized to the band 8Q13. This is not the type of information that I would ask you to uh, <clears throat> uh, remember, but uh, it's included because uh, of the remainder of this statement using in situ hybridization. We did talk about that method uh, to metaphase um, uh, chromosomes. So remember, the, the metaphase chromosomes are the most condensed. It is possible to, to perform in situ hybridization and actually identify the chromosome uh, and even the, the portion or specific region uh, of uh, chromosome uh, wherein you would find the uh, gene or gene, gene locus or gene loci uh, for your um, gene product of interest, in this case the CRH. So as it turns out, um, <clears throat> there was absence of secondary hybridization, so it's strongly suggested that the hypothalamic and placental CRH 
expression are, are transcribed from the same gene. <clears throat> so uh, somehow in the placenta, and even in these other uh, tissues, uh, organs in their tissue cells <clears throat> that were on the list in the prior slide, uh, we get a tissue-specific and cell-specific gene expression there that is distinct from neural tissue and neuron uh, cell type <clears throat> um, gene expression. Even the regional gene expression to the paraventricular nucleus of the hypothalamus and so on and so forth for refining the cell-specific gene expression once you get past the tissue. <clears throat> so remember, neural tissue includes both the neuron and the glial cells. So when we talk about neural tissue gene expression, uh, you have to go then to cell-specific gene expression for neuron-specific, and then of course we know it's regional, so somehow there's just subsets of neurons throughout the brain that selectively express the genes. So there's still a level of sophistication for understanding the unique cellular uh, gene expression uh, that is observed. <clears throat> so this is an example of somehow using one gene to get it expressed in different uh, tissues. So the promoter region uh, of this gene we would suspect to be the exact same in each of these uh, tish different tissues. <clears throat> so somehow in those tissues the transcription factors for tissue specific and gene specific excuse me, cell-specific gene expression for the CRH <clears throat> um, managed to get this gene uh, uncoiled uh, enough so that it is uh, available for regulated gene expression. <clears throat> uh, at the time I did this search, I found one paper that talked about uh, post-translational processing of the, the corticotropin-releasing factor at that time still had not been established as the uh, unique uh, secretagogue that is you know, responsible for the uh, ACTH release <clears throat> within the, the, C, the HPA axis. Since then, of course, it has been accepted as that <clears throat> um, <clears throat> particular recent releasing hormone, so we no longer call it C CRF or corticotropin releasing factor unless it's an old article that you're looking at, it is now referred to as the CRH. And it is understood that there are additional secretagogues for ACTH. So a G75 Cephidex uh, chromatography column was used uh, to reveal two main peaks. <clears throat> so here we're seeing some of these original methods that were used to try to isolate different uh, peptides of different sizes from all those ovine hypothalami that uh, Wiley Valey and his group and, and many others uh, also were uh, uh, using to chase down uh, the different hypothalamic hormones. And this obviously separates on size, the general nature of the, the peptides and so on and so forth. You collect fractions and then run them through some type of a detection device like a, a HPLC. Uh, with a column set up for peptides in this size and then uh, after separation it goes across a, a UV detector so you get a peak for the peptides uh, in each of the fractions. Uh, those can go to uh, radio amino assay types of uh, procedures to detect how much of a particular um, immunoreactive molecule is in there so if you used an antibody <coughs> to uh, CRF. In this case, what they did is uh, on their chromatography, uh, they found uh, a major peak that co eluded with uh, exogenously uh, added synthetic ovine, the O is ovine, uh, CRF1 through 41. So this is another approach of saying in this fraction from my column, <clears throat> I'm measuring a peak that corresponds to uh, the same peak or coalutes with uh, what I have added. But another peak uh, was found uh, that coalluted, uh, excuse me, that uh, eluded eight fractions later. <clears throat> so there appears to be uh, this either, uh, I think in this they used uh, antibodies uh, to detect it. Uh, <clears throat> so the coalution as well as using antibodies on the fractions uh, to identify CRF 
or CRH, as we would call it now, immunoreactivity. <clears throat> so the coelution with the known molecule is important to substantiate its behavior on your, your chromatography column, and then you follow it up with antibodies uh, to uh, uh, verify that it has the, the ident identical immunoreactivity. So this doesn't take us anywhere else other than letting us uh, recall some of these uh, more traditional or historically useful and still very useful if this is uh, your, the approach that you need to take uh, and it is an appropriate application <coughs> uh, methods. So most importantly, uh, we can see the CRF or the CRH uh, on the uh, um, illustration here uh, <coughs> toward the carboxy terminus uh, of the pre-pro uh, uh, CRF. CRH, as we should call it now. <clears throat> uh, and of course, we know it's the pre-pro because the putative signal peptide is still present. Uh, the putative or the signal peptide or the signal sequence uh, is actually cleaved. Uh, it's one of the first events. So it's cleaved immediately upon uh, this uh, peptide, this growing peptide uh, <clears throat> entering the lumen of the endoplasmic reticulum. So there's an enzymatic cleavage of the signal peptide first, and then later uh, the other post-translational events will occur. We see many uh, residues that, uh, <coughs> or adjacent residues that are th these uh, basic amino acids. So arg arg, lice arg, arg lice, arg arg, right here <coughs> uh, near the the site of cleavage where the, the CRH molecule would be released and then a, a gly lice where there could be cleavage and then this glycine uh, <clears throat> to be post-translationally pro post -translation -translationally processed as we had mentioned before. Now we can uh, discuss a bit the <clears throat> uh, five prime uh, flanking region of the uh, uh, HCRH gene. <clears throat> so one other aspect of the post-translational processing, recall, that I mentioned is that uh, uh, the alpha helical uh, <clears throat> formation for the final biologically active uh, CRH uh, 1 through 41. So the, uh, the sequence of the proximal uh, 3,625 uh, nucleotides in the five prime flanking a region uh, to, of the major mRNA start site on the human CRH gene uh, has been performed and it identified several putative regulatory elements. So remember our discussion of the uh, analysis, uh, promoter region analysis, first you get the gene, <clears throat> then you get the upstream region, five prime uh, flanking region, uh, then you sequence that and then you look for any sequences uh, that are uh, <clears throat> consensual to the known regulatory elements and then they can be identified as putative regulatory elements until functional assays are performed <clears throat> and as well other studies to verify that they're functional regulatory elements and that they uh, are bound by trans uh, the cognate transcription factors uh, in situ in the, uh, uh <clears throat> the tissue uh, where you would suspect it most. Uh, did not detect any glucocorticoid responsive elements uh, at the time of this study, <clears throat> which uh, of course immediately in your mind should make you think uh, that <clears throat> um, we would expect a GRE because <clears throat> the GRE would be involved in the negative feedback of hormones three or hormone three, uh, the glucocorticoids, on hormone one gene expression. We'll see that since then uh, it has been found on the CRH promoter region, <clears throat> they either missed it or did not sequence uh, far enough upstream uh, to find it. Uh, they did find five interspersed perfect half palindromic uh, estrogen responsive elements, EREs, uh, which might confer estrogen regular regulates ability <laughs> to the HCRH gene. <clears throat> so remember we talked about the interaction of the HPA and the HPG axis. Keep in mind, whenever you talk about the uh, HPA axis or whenever you're considering the HPA axis, 
It is strongly implicated in uh, especially mood uh, altering uh, um, mental uh, disorders. So depression is a major one. So postpartum depression, uh, depression or uh, subdued affect during pregnancy <clears throat> are all related to uh, disruptions of the HPA axis or you suspect possible disruptions because it's been known for a long time that the HPA axis, especially the feedback uh, of the glucocorticoids on the HPA axis uh, is disrupted in uh, major uh, depressive disorders in humans. So that's been known for a long, long time. <clears throat> this now brings into light the interaction uh, between the HPA and the HBG axes, in particular, of course, in females. So uh, <clears throat> uh, premenstrual syndrome, uh, also you begin to suspect uh, an interaction between the HPG and the HPA axis. So this was not surprising to anyone uh, that this was a, a, a clear observation in initial studies of sequencing the promoter region for CRH. The lack of the uh, GRE <coughs> certainly was uh, surprising, uh, but um, as I said later, it was uh, discovered. Next, we consider the possibility of protein kinase C activation, increasing the quantity and the poly A tail length of corticotropin releasing hormone messenger RNA. So the protein kinase C should immediately remind us uh, the G coupled receptors with the G protein, the G sub PLC uh, for the phospholipase uh, C that uh, cleaves the IP, uh, the inositol phosphate in the membrane to IP3 and diacylglycerol. And the diacylglycerol, as you recall, activates protein kinase C. And the C is for the phospholipase C uh, enzyme name, that enzyme that's acting on the inositol phosphate uh, in the membrane originally. So the protein kinase C uh, activation uh, is related to uh, many different neurotransmitter receptors uh, known to be uh, of neuro receptors of neurotransmitters known to be involved in regulating the HPA axis. So it was a, a, a prime suspect uh, molecule or pathway, uh, second messenger pathway of interest uh, to investigate. So can this uh, kinase lead to an increased expression of CRH message uh, uh, and uh, are there any effects on the mRNA? And we know uh, poly, a, poly A tail length uh, correlates with, or we originally said that the reason, one of the functions of the poly A tail is to stabilize the message once it is in the cytoplasm. So the longer the tail, the more stable the message, whether it's being translated or not, <clears throat> it's going to be available for a longer period of time because its half-life has been extended uh, by having an extended poly A tail. So in this study, uh, 100 nanomolar concentration of 12O uh, tetra decanoil, dec decanoil? <laughs> I can't even pronounce that, uh, four ball 13 acetate, or just TPA, thank you very much, a four ball ester uh, that activates protein kinase C. So there are a variety of uh, chemicals that are available, uh, in this case the four ball ester that bypasses uh, the G coupling mechanism uh, <clears throat> to activate these second messenger systems uh, rather selectively uh, and more directly. So they can be used to get right to all of the protein kinase regardless of what receptor they might be coupled to. You just can answer the question, is it a protein kinase C dependent process that we are looking at? <clears throat> so it will activate the protein kinase C. And using this uh, molecule, this chemical, uh, it resulted in a rapid, within one hour, and prolonged over a, a three-day period, 72 hours, increase in the CRH mRNA levels with the maximum increase of 16-fold or observed at about 24 hours. <clears throat> so we know that protein kinase C 
cannot act directly on a gene, uh, promote a region to increase expression. So there's something in between. Uh, and so somehow protein kinase C is uh, activating a transcription factor, and that transcription factor uh, is very likely responsible for uh, this um, immediate and prolonged, or maybe a population of transcription factors. It might not be only one. Uh, uh, the immediate and the prolonged, or the acute and the chronic, to equate it with acute and the chronic effects of ACTH on, uh, or the cyclic AMP dependent uh, uh, responses at the adrenal cortex for steroid synthesis, as you recall. So this is quite a common thing to see an acute and a chronic or a rapid and a prolonged responsiveness uh, in the HPA axis and other uh, biological systems in general. So there was a peak at about 24 hours. So because it, uh, it does increase and then uh, reach a peak and then ultimately decrease, and it's from one hour to uh, 72 hours, uh, it really makes you think that multiple uh, transcription factors are likely to be involved. The increases in the CRH mRNA poly A tail length uh, potentially may influence the CRH uh, mRNA stability and translatability uh, as we had mentioned. So um, in essence then, activation of receptors that are coupled to protein kinase C ultimately as part of their second messenger uh, amplification system uh, will lead to sustained, uh, you know, immediate and sustained increases in the expression of CRH and very likely of the peptide uh, in order to survive the situation that triggered this event in the first place. Of course, this is a, a chemical exploitation of the biological system, uh, but we understand it uh, in the biological context when we try to interpret it. Next, then, is the identification of a cyclic adenosine monophosphate, or CAMP, responsive element, or CRE, uh, in the rat corticotropin-releasing hormone gene. On a lot of these slides in the title, there's a big space there. I can't seem to get rid of it, so um, I've just left it so that the words are there. So uh, in this instance, the molecular mechanisms involved in the regulation of the expression of the rat CRH gene were examined in rat pheochromocytoma, or PC12 cells. Uh, pheochromocytoma is a tumor cell line uh, from the adrenal medulla. <clears throat> so they behave uh, somewhat similarly to neurons, as you, request, as you uh, recall from our discussions of the uh, APUD system, uh, <clears throat> that uh, the cell lineage uh, to the adrenal medullary cells is uh, similar to peripheral neurons such as uh, the sensory neurons and the postganglionic uh, <coughs> autonomic neurons. So the adrenal medulla uh, forming this tumor, the PC12 tumor in, rat, in rats in this case, uh, provides a convenient cell line uh, to test uh, genes that are typically expressed in neurons uh, <coughs> um, and uh, not so much that it would be a tissue-specific and cell-specific convenience, because in transient transfection that isn't always necessary, <clears throat> uh, but because you would expect those cells to be expressing genes uh, for many other molecules that would be uh, involved in re regulating the expression of the gene that you are uh, evaluating, or uh, the gene for which you are evaluating the promoter region, right? So um, they transiently transfected them with a chimeric gene containing 1.4 kilobases. So uh, uh, the other one, I've forgotten how far they sequenced. It was uh, up about uh, 4,000 nucleotides uh, in the five prime flanking region. In this case, they just took 1.4 kilobases, so it's uh, not uh, all-inclusive uh, of the rat CRH 5 prime flanking, so the promoter region, fused to a bacterial reporter gene encoding the, the uh, cat, as you recall. We studied that uh, in general with the methods. <clears throat> so here's an application of that method. 
the cyclic AMP analogs, there are several analogs that act uh, um, <clears throat> the same as, uh, to borrow the terminology, as an agonist uh, for the cyclic AMP. They just uh, uh, are uh, <clears throat> not degraded as rapidly, so the half-life is longer, so they're convenient molecules to work with rather than the cyclic AMP themselves. So some CMP, CAMP analogs or activators of the adenylate cyclase positively regulated the expression of that uh, chimeric gene <coughs> uh, in these PC12 cells. So the CAT activity increased more than 15-fold. So it's a very potent uh, amplification uh, of the uh, reporter gene. So, uh, <coughs> reporter gene response, I should say, amplification of the reporter gene response. So this means that the expression of the transient gene uh, was uh, quite uh, robust. <coughs> so the response element to the cyclic AMP, the CRE, uh, has been localized to a 59 base pair region located between uh, 238 and 180 uh, base pairs uh, five prime to the putative CRH uh, mRNA cap site. So here's another site of orientation uh, <coughs> uh, in these types of evaluations. It's not necessarily the start site, but the putative five uh, prime cap site uh, on the message that would be produced. So uh, it's not our traditional zero site that we think about, so we wouldn't assign negative numbers to these because the negative numbers are always with reference to that zero uh, point at the start site, <clears throat> the transcription start site. So the uh, CREs definitely were within the 1.4 kilobases uh, that they used in their reported gene. <clears throat> uh, excuse me, their chimeric gene. Uh, the truncated, including the truncated uh, promoter region for CRH. So now let's take a look at the transcriptional regulation of the HCRH, change factor to hormone, gene expression uh, by the, the cyclic AMP, uh, and look at differential effects of the proximal and distal uh, promoter elements. So we talked about this approach for uh, studying promoter regions as well truncating them until you uh, lose the uh, functional responsiveness uh, for the particular uh, transcription factor of interest or mechanism of interest. So stimulation of the PKA dependent pathway by the cyclic AMP analogs or forskolin. So forskolin uh, bypasses the G protein uh, mechanism and activates the adenylate cyclase uh, directly. Uh, so here we've seen an example of a chemical that activates the PKC directly, uh, you know, at least bypassing the receptor, uh, and forskolin, uh, a chemical bypassing the, uh, the G protein receptors, getting right at the adenylate cyclase. So these are useful uh, tools to investigate these systems and they, pro they produce a robust response in your cells <coughs> um, so that uh, multiple receptors uh, that use the cyclic AMP system uh, would have to be all bombarded with their agonists to produce a similar response. You just get past those receptors and just use a molecule that robustly activates any adenylate cyclase uh, that's present. So this is basically the strategy. That also establishes whether a response is uh, dependent upon adenylate cyclase. It's one mechanism of investigating that. <clears throat> so there was a dose-dependent increase in the levels of the CRF uh, mRNA when intact uh, HCRH uh, gene was stably transfected and expressed in mouse uh, corticotrope uh, AT, uh, T2, T20 uh, cell lines. So now we're beginning to see the utilization of particular, almost manufactured, if you will, or conveniently exploited tumor cell lines uh, to uh, either transiently transfect and study promoters or stably transfect uh, and then having a permanent cell line uh, that includes your, um, 
your promoter under investigation with the reporter gene or whatever uh, gene you're using. In this case, they use the intact uh, human CRF uh, or CRH gene, so they don't have a reporter gene. They somehow have to track either the peptide, uh, if they want to take it all the way to translation, or the message uh, <clears throat> with uh, some uh, approach in this era, the northern blot was the most common one. So in the incubation with the cyclic AMP, there was a rapid increase in the CRF mRNA, which was completely blocked by pretreatment with actinomycin D, an inhibitor of transcription. So the conclusion from this type of a, a, a study is that the cyclic AMP induced increase in CRH mRNA is transcriptional uh, dependent or transcription dependent or dependent upon transcription. Why? Because actinomycin D, which is a general uh, inhibitor of transcription, uh, prevented the uh, cyclic AMP induced uh, increase in the, the message of interest. So this is the way of presenting the data. <clears throat> the conclusion statement, the conclusion that you draw is that cyclic AMP induced expression of CRH uh, messenger RNA is transcription dependent or dependent upon transcription. <clears throat> Cyclohexamide is a protein uh, synthesis inhibitor, so it blocks at the level of translation produced an independent uh, increase in CRH or CRF mRNA, so it raised baseline expression, but it did not change the relative induction of the CRF mRNA produced by the cyclic AMP. <clears throat> so from this we would conclude that even though we have a shift in baseline expression <clears throat> by blocking protein synthesis, the cyclic AMP induced increase of CRF mRNA expression uh, is independent of protein synthesis. So the cyclic AMP is acting at the level of transcription uh, and does not require a prior synthesis of any protein in order to do that. So it's probably uh, acting on uh, <clears throat> nascent or present transcription factors through some mechanism, and we now know it's to activation of PKA, phosphorylation of CREB, and CREB binding to the CRE. But anyway, at the times these were being worked out, this was the uh, approach to determine if a new protein had to be synthesized in order for the cyclic AMP to affect the transcription. So the solution hybridization studies used using intron and exon specific H uh, CRF probes uh, demonstrated a rapid rise in the nuclear CRF heteronuclear, HN is heteronuclear RNA, which was uh, apparent within 15 minutes of cyclic AMP incubation and preceded the rise in the cytoplasmic CRF mRNA. So remember we talked about heteronuclear <coughs> RNA being uh, the mixture of the uh, RNA from the initial transcript uh, through the RNA processing, basically the splicing processes, uh, to the mature mRNA within the nucleus. <clears throat> and if you can uh, have an assay that uh, quantitates the amount of heteronuclear RNA, you have a more direct index, very reliable index of rate of transcription. If you just look at messenger RNA levels in the cytoplasm, you only have a static index of message content at that one point in time. It's found to be a pretty tight correlation in many cases, so concluding um, uh, that there is a change in rate of transcription based upon looking at static cytoplasmic message levels is quite widely accepted, but still it, it, we shouldn't get so comfortable not to question whether it is truly reflecting uh, and in a change in transcription. Anyway, in this case, we see that there's an increase in a rapid increase in heteronuclear, followed by uh, increase in cytoplasmic. 
the two together, you know, that are um, uh, independent of protein synthesis and dependent upon transcription. <clears throat> so uh, we're convinced that there is a change in uh, gene transcription rate. So they conclude that the cyclic AMP effects on the CRF gene expression uh, occur rapidly, do not require new protein synthesis, and are initiated within the nuclear compartment consistent with the direct effect on the gene transcription. So next, of course, was the need to identify CREB uh, as uh, the uh, protein, the transcription factor in this pathway. So the CREB uh, is uh, exceptional in that it is constitutively bound to the promoter. We now though know that it is not quite so exceptional as we've looked at others, but at the time this uh, came about, it was exceptional. Uh, so it's sitting on the promoter, so it's already in the nucleus. It's constitutively expressed. The protein, once it's translated or synthesized uh, and uh, post-translation processed, it has access to the nucleus, it's bouncing around, it can uh, find and sit on the CRE, and then it has to be phosphorylated to become activated. And while it's there, uh, it, uh, it recruits the CREB binding protein, the CBP that we've uh, mentioned in other lectures, to form the CREB CBP promoter complex. So the protein DNA complexes were cross-linked <clears throat> in cells expressing endogenous HCRH gene by exposure to a 10 nanosecond pulse of high energy UV laser light. So this will cross-link the proteins. <clears throat> so this is an approach to, uh, to capturing the DNA with the protein bound to it. And then you can uh, investigate that later. So uh, after the cross-linking, then you can pull out the proteins that you want using immune affinity uh, purification of the CREB DNA complexes. Then you can look at uh, the, this complex with a variety of approaches. In this case, the binding of the CREB to a fragment on the HCRH promoter containing a canonical functional uh, CRE was absent in untreated cells but was specifically induced after activation of the protein kinase A pathway uh, with the forskolin. <clears throat> so when they did not treat cells, uh, then they did not find the CREB bound to the CRH promoter, <clears throat> but after forskolin application to activate the protein kinase A pathway, they did find through this approach uh, <clears throat> CREB bound to promoter regions uh, that had CREs uh, uh, from the CRH gene. So the glucocorticoids uh, are next in our consideration for the negative feedback. The glucocorticoids inhibit the stress-induced phosphorylation of CREB in CRH neurons in the hypothalamic paraventricular nucleus. So the CRH gene contains a perfect palindromic uh, motif uh, in its promoter region that allows the binding of the CREB, as we just noted. So there are CREs, at least one CRE, on uh, the promoter region for CRH. <clears throat> Antisera to the CREB and the phospho CREB. Remember, the CREB is always present, so an antiserum to CREB would show the total CREB. An antibody to the phospho CREB would only show the activated CREB, and this antibody was generated, it's a monoclonal, uh, to the serine-133 residue uh, phosphorylated, that is uh, phosphorylated on, on CREB. So the active phosphorylated form of CREB is phosphorylated at its serine-133 residue. And these were used for immunohistochemical studies uh, on the rat brain. So we would predict they'd see CREB everywhere and then only phospho-CREB in the cells that had been activated. <clears throat> so the method of activation was in using a stress. So in non-stressed animals, the, the CREB venostaining was confined to the nucleus of cells ubiquitously throughout the hypothalamus, as we would predict. It, in its nascent form, it sits on the nuclear uh, DNA 
uh, wherever that can get to a CRE. <clears throat> but the phosphocreb uh, immunostaining was di discreetly localized uh, in magnocellular neurons and only a few cells in the medial uh, parvocellular division of the uh, paraventricular nucleus where we know the CRH neurons are located. So this is the location in non-stressed animals. So there's some basal level of phosphorylization. <clears throat> So with double uh, immunolabeling for the CRH antiserum, it, re it revealed that the majority of the hypophysiotrophic CRH neurons in stressed animals expressed the phosphocreb. We would have predicted that. Stress the animals, you get a change from the basal levels where you get a lot of phosphocreb, and it's in the CRH neurons. That's the stress uh, affecting the HPA axis. It fits. <clears throat> Uh, following systemic administration of dexamethasone, 100 micrograms per day for 2.5 days before immunostaining and before stressing, the phosphocreb immunostraining was completely abolished in the P parvocellular CRH uh, producing neurons after ether or handling stress. So ether is a very potent chemical activator of the HPA axis. <clears throat> so it's a standard uh, one used it's just a brief exposure, uh, and it really uh, just activates the AP, HPA axis. Uh, these results demonstrate that glucocorticoids suppress the Krebs phosphorylation in the hypophysiotropic CRH neurons and suggest that prevention of this phosphorylation of Krebs is a possible mechanism for feedback inhibition. Remember, at this time, uh, there was no GRE identified on the promoter region for CRH, so we had to understand the negative feedback one way or another. So um, this was the approach that was used. Um, next, of course, with closer investigation, a negative GRE was found on the human G CRH gene in transiently transfected AT, uh, T20 cells. Uh, you now know what kind those are. The cyclic AMP-dependent transcriptional activation was mediated largely through a, a classical consensus uh, CRE at minus 224 base pairs. Whenever the minus is used, we know that it is, is with reference to uh, the start site. The dexamethasone produced a specific two- to three-fold repression of cyclic AMP stimulated but not basal CRH promoter activity, which is what we'd expect for a negative feedback. So they did find a specific high affinity binding of the GR, glucocorticoid receptor, or GR, uh, on the DNA <coughs> um, binding uh, domain to its uh, promoter region uh, <coughs> in, uh, using an electrophoretic mobility shift assay, or the EMSA. Remember, we talked about the uh, electromobility uh, shift assay where you isolate the DNA, you add the transcription factor. In this case, they just used the, the glucocorticoid receptor DNA binding domain, <clears throat> so it's uh, activated. And that should slow down the mobility uh, of the DNA versus the sample where you did not add it. <clears throat> uh, so it was a way of showing that there is a candidate GRE somewhere on the promoter region of the CRH gene. <clears throat> the cyclic AMP dependent activation of the CRH promoter is mediated primarily by the CRE at the minus 224 uh, is one conclusion. The second is uh, the glucocorticoid dependent repression is specific for the CRH promoter and not a generalized effect of glucocorticoid signaling or interference with the protein kinase A signaling pathway. Remember in the previous one we talked about it inhibiting Krebs, so they ruled that out as a primary factor in their study. A highly conserved region between minus 278 and minus 249 base pairs is critical for the glucocorticoid dependent repression. Uh, promoter truncation studies that should tell us immediately the mechanism, the approach that, that they used, the method that they used. 
Glucocorticoid receptor is capable of interacting directly with this functionally defined negative glucocorticoid response element, or GRE, on the CRH promoter. So these are the conclusions from their study. So we've seen this historical prog progression. Let me just check how many more slides there are. 16 of 20. Let's just push on and, uh, and complete this. <clears throat> this, uh, I think, is one of the final points. Uh, the glucocorticoids act through another mechanism. They provoke a shift from the, two, the alpha-2 to the alpha-1 adrenal receptor activities in cultured hypothalamic slices, leading to opposite noradrenaline or norepinephrine effect on the CRH uh, hormone release. So now we can take it back to the level of neuroendocrine uh, transduction. Uh, the neurotransmitter affecting the, C the CRH neuron, affecting uh, <coughs> uh, the release. So uh, the stimulatory effect of norepinephrine on CRH release was reversed in a dose-dependent manner by increasing the concentrations of the alpha-1 adren adrenoreceptor antagonist, prazosin. The alpha didn't uh, paste in here when I did the copy-paste into the slide. Uh, activation of protein kinase C by acute treatment with 4-ball 12 myristate 13 acetate, one of those 4-ball esters, remember, uh, 0.5 micromolar for one hour, mimicked noradrenaline stimulation of CRH secretion, implicating, of course, uh, G-coupling of the alpha adrenergic receptor to the uh, G sub PLC uh, G protein <clears throat> and to that um, uh, IP3 second messenger system that also leads through the uh, ultimately to the activation of the PKC <clears throat> through the diacylglycerol. <laughs> so the activation of L-type calcium channels by Bay K8644 uh, also produced an increase in the CRH secretion. So uh, the calcium uh, influx and acting as a second messenger is another potential mechanism uh, for this effect. The inhibitory effect of uh, norepinephrine on CRH secretion from slices cultured in steroid-free medium was markedly reversed, first by the alpha-2 adenoreceptor antagonist yohimbine uh, by treatment with pertussis toxin uh, that acts at the G protein, and by the addition of 4-aminopyridine, a potassium channel blocker, <clears throat> so uh, blocking uh, any hyperpolarization, and uh, acute treatment with 4-ball 12 myristate 13 acetate, the 4-ball ester, uh, did not change the inhibitory uh, norepinephrine uh, effect. So we want to ponder these for a while to think about the mechanisms and see what they understand, or excuse me, what they uh, might mean. So all these effects were reversed by daily corticosterone supplementation for as long as they were tested. So in the end, these results are consistent with the steroid-dependent change in the nature of adrenergic receptors and its associated transduction pathways involved in the regulation of CRH secretion in the hypothalamus. In other words, when hormone three levels are high, you're going to shift to an inhibitory effect, and when hormone three levels are at basal levels and you activate the noradrenergic system uh, under uh, stressful conditions, for example, then you're going to have a stimulatory effect. So here is a prime example of modulation of receptor-mediated effects uh, on the neuroendocrine transduction mechanisms uh, for release. And the final two slides are just to remind us of the ACTH molecule that we've discussed in quite detail that originates from the pro-opio-melanocortin or the POMC uh, uh, pre -pro, excuse me, pro hormone. I won't spend any time on that. And of course, the adrenal steroids originating from cholesterol uh, <clears throat> uh, that we've discussed uh, in the steroidogenesis lecture, where the aldosterone uh, is produced from progesterone in the uh, adrenal uh, cortex, the zona glomerulosa, and the cortisol uh, is uh, produced in humans, 
Corticosterone is the primary one in rodents, in the uh, zona fasciculata, and the androgens uh, can be synthesized in the zona reticularis. So this uh, ends our discussion of the uh, of the, <coughs> the HPT and the HPA axis, introducing the HPG axis uh, in males and females, the menstrual and estrocycles and steroidogenesis, which is the material that's uh, be covered on test three. So I appreciate your time and attention and I hope to see you again soon.